Welcome to our video on sizing steel wide flange beams from tables. We're looking initially at simple span beams. Uh, this is the reading material that's in chapter 6, section 3 on steel beams, and subsection 3 is on steel wide flange beams. And this is the third in our uh, three part uh, video on the subject matter. So this is video C, uh, focusing on sizing for moment capacity. So just to refresh your mind, we're sizing for moment capacity and stiffness in steel beams. We already went through a sizing procedure for stiffness and you'll recall that it is based on uh, using the live load. So it's non-iterative because None of the calculations change once you've established a certain weight for the self-weight of the beam. Um, it, the, the sizing for stiffness also gives a baseline to start the calculation for moment capacity because the moment capacity has to include the self-weight of the beam and you need to have some kind of reasonable estimate of what that is before you start the sizing procedure. So we do stiffness sizing first, then we use the output of that as the first input to moment capacity where the assumed uh, self-weight of the beam that's used in calculating moment capacity is in fact the self-weight of the beam that was derived from sizing for stiffness. Uh, I'll also remind you we're working on a uh, 30 by 30 grid, column grid, and the joist spacing is 5 feet and the portion of the floor that's supported by the perimeter girder or the single loaded girder is 15 feet wide. The double loaded girder supports a swash of floor that's 30 feet wide. <coughs> so we're going to be calculating a moment and it will include the total factored line distributed load. So the imposed dead load times 1.2 the self-weight of the beam is derived from the stiffness uh, sizing procedure times 1.2 plus the live load times 1.6. So it's W total factored times L squared over 8. And again, the warning is work out the units before you go into Excel. So we're going to do that down here. It's uh, W times L squared over 8, which is kips per foot for W foot times foot for L squared and this foot cancels out with that foot and we're left in units of kip feet which is actually the units uh, in which moment capacity is expressed. So we don't actually have any conversion factors but it's still important that we go through this stage always to make sure whether we have conversion factors or not. Okay, so in the previous steps, we did our load calculations. Um, we did our sizing for stiffness, and we came up with a W12 by 14 based on stiffness requirements. And now we're going to go into sizing for moment strength. So we have the sizing procedure for joist, single loaded girders, and double loaded girders. And again, we're starting on the roof and working downward towards the floor. And we could size the floor before the roof because the load of the roof doesn't actually go on the floor, it goes on the columns. But in this orderly way in which we're doing things, we're gonna start with the roof. So we're going to go to our active spreadsheet. Again, we're sizing for moment strength. Over to the left here, we did the sizing for stiffness. And I'm going to just scroll down in order to get all of the roof joists in place. The first thing we got to do is calculate a W factor total. So for the joist, it's 1.2 times W imposed dead plus 1.6 times W live plus 1.2 times the self weight of the joist. And just to go back, the self weight that we're going to start with is 14 pounds per foot because our stiffness analysis said we needed a W12 by 14. So we're going to go back over here 
and we're going to look at our equation and uh, that's right here we have 1.2 times F28 F28 by the way we'll go back there for a moment this is F28 which is the line distributed dead load so we have 1.2 times that plus 1.6 times G28 G28 was the line distributed live load and then we have 1.2 times O28. So if we go back, we see that O28 is this 14 pounds per linear foot, which is what we got from the stiffness sizing procedure. So we put that O28 here, but then we got to divide by 1,000 because we want to get it into kips per foot instead of pounds per foot. So we're going to convert the pounds to kips by throwing in this conversion factor of a thousand. So this term right here accounts for the self weight, the factored self weight of the joist based on this sizing procedure. So that's what this formula gives us. So it's 0.297 kips per foot and then the moment is W factor total times L squared over 8 and it will come out in units of kip feet and the formula looks like this it's P28 which is this value right here times B28 which is the length of the joist times B28 divided by 8 and we come out with 33.4 kip feet so to give you a sense of how big that number is, if you were strong enough <coughs> to exert a force of one kip, you'd need a lever arm of 33.4 feet to produce this kind of effect. In other words, you'd have to be a monster strong person and you'd have to have a huge lever arm in order to get this. But fortunately, steel is so strong that it's actually pretty efficient in resisting this. And it's going to take a very small beam. But we're going to go look it up now. Um, we're looking for a beam with this moment capacity. So we're going to go over to our tables and scroll down. We're going to have a bunch of tables that look like this. And here we have shape, shape, shape. And we got our familiar cross-sectional stiffness uh, here and there. And we've got a quantity called Z, which we're not going to bother with right now because we just calculated what the moment was that we need. And the, the portion of this table that serves that purpose is this V sub B times M sub P X. And <coughs> basically... This is the design moment capacity and phi, by the way, is the resistance factor that we use to reduce everything. So we got a proper resistance factor for the beam and this is the moment capacity or the, the uh, ultimate moment capacity uh, before yielding. So, uh, excuse me, before we reach uh, the failure point for the beam which is at ultimate strength. So the, the numbers we want to look at are the shape in this column and uh, the moment capacity here. And again, we have moment capacity here and moment capacity there. So we're looking at the first column and the last column. And we have a few pages of these. So the next page is just smaller sections. And then we got some blow ups of that. And then we got the last page, which are the smallest sections where we have, this is the table here, and then I've blown up the table. So you'll notice the W10 by 12 has just been made larger here, but probably this is readable as it is, but to make life a little easier, I've blown it up over here. So we want to go look in this table and find what we're looking for. And now I got to go back and remind myself that what we're looking for is 33.4 kip feet of capacity. And when I go here and I look at this last column, this is the column I want. So I see that actually what I need 
is less than what's provided by the weakest beam that they even list, which is a W10 by 12 in this case. So we got 47.3, so we're now going to go into our table and we're going to write 47.3 for a W10 by 12. Now, this column is the lightest W section that has adequate moment capacity. Uh, in the preceding part, though, we found the lightest beam that has adequate stiffness. The stiffness criterion yielded a W12 by 14. Our strength criterion is only yielding a W10 by 12. We have to satisfy both, which means we have to take the bigger and stronger and stiffer one, which is a W12 by 14, which is what we arrived at through the stiffness analysis or stiffness design. So this is for strength, but it turns out strength doesn't control in this case, stiffness does. All right, so now we come down and life gets a little more interesting now um, for the following reason. When we size the joist, we only had to account for the self weight of the joist itself. When we get down here, we're going to account for the imposed dead, the imposed live with or the live load with appropriate factors. Then we're going to have a 1.2 times the W self weight of the joist as those joists load the girder, and then a 1.2 times W self of the girder. This number that we start with, by the way, is the one we got from stiffness design right back here, which is a W14 by 22. So this is a little tricky to calculate this. But we're going to say W self of the joist on the perimeter girders is the weight of the joist per linear foot times what the joist, what the girder holds, which is half the joist. So we take the length of the joist, we divide by two, we multiply times the self weight of the joist, and then we divide by the spacing of the joist. And the reason is this is a point force that occurs at whatever the spacing. So in this case, S is five feet. So every five feet, we have half of the joist on there. That's on the perimeter girders or the single loaded girders. So now we can substitute that in here and we end up with this formula, which is 1.2 times F31, which is the imposed dead load, 1.6 times G31, where G31 is the imposed, is the live load, the line distributed live load. Then we got 1.2 times 031 over 1,000. So this is, let's go see 031, so we'll flip back here. This is 031, which was, excuse me, right here, the self-weight of the perimeter or single loaded girder based on stiffness design was 22. So we put that in here and we divide by a thousand to convert it to pounds per foot. So that's this term right here, the self weight of the girder. And then we got this screwy term right here, which is the joist term. It's 1.2 for the load factor times um, B28, which is the length of the joist over two times W of the joist, which was uh, in this case, uh, I've gotten fancier probably than I needed to because I went all the way over here and I put in that right there, which was the larger of the two. And I shouldn't have gotten that fancy. So actually, I'm going to go back here to make life a little easier. And I'm going to just take the weight of the girder, which was supposed to be 028, I think, so of the joist rather. So that's it, 028. So I'm going to put 028 because I don't want to confuse you by being too fancy here. I want to go right there and it says 028, which is the self weight of the joist. Um, actually, I'm sorry, that joist already is sized. You're watching me in at midnight kind of screwing up here but that's okay you'll learn from my mistakes okay so ab28 was the final 
self weight of the joist and that's already sized so we're putting AB28 ooh Yeah, well, I might have to edit this video at some point. B28 over 2, which is the length of the joist over 2, times W for the joist, which is AB28. Turns out to be 14. Divided by 1,000 to get it into kips per foot. And then we're going to divide by C28, which I'll go back and show you is the spacing. So C28 is the spacing. So all that is working out that formula right there. And that's what this last term is about. Okay, so when we do all that, we get uh, 0.917 kips per foot. And when we roll that into our formula for the moment, which is this value, P31, times the length of the girder times the length of the girder divided by 8, we get 103 kip feet. So we go to our table, and we look again for 103 and we scan up here and we see a W. This is a hundred this is the moment column. We go to 110, we get a W twelve by twenty-two. So we're gonna go record a W twelve by twenty-two and hundred and ten uh, kip feet of capacity. And again, when we go look at the uh, sizing for stiffness, we needed a W fourteen by twenty-two. For strength, we only need a 12 by 22. So we're going to put W14 by 22 because we have to take the larger and stronger of those two. So we have a similar formula down here for the double loaded girder. Again, we introduce all the information having to do with the joist in exactly the same way, except instead of dividing B28 by the length by 2, we're going to have just the total length because the double loaded or the interior girder supports a swash of floor that in this case is 30 feet wide, which is the length of the joist. So we have B28 times AB28, which is again this number right here to account for the self weight of the joist. And again, we're going to divide by the spacing of the joist to get it into units of kips per foot because uh, this is just a point force right here that it is applied every five feet by the joist. And then again we have O34, which is, if we go back here to the left, it is the weight of the double-loaded roof joist as uh, determined by um, stiffness analysis. So, <clears throat> we're going to put that in there. We're going to calculate um, first the load W and then the moment, which is 205.1 kip feet. And when we go back to our table, uh, you'll notice that the largest one on this last page is 203. And we are targeting um, 205.1. So we're going to have to get off that last page there and go look at this page and this is 203 and so we're going to have to kick all the way up to this bold number right here 203 doesn't work uh, 249 does this appears to be way oversized but not really it's it's pretty light beam a w18 by 35 so we're going to come here and we're going to write w18 by 35 is the required size for strength. Now if we go back we discover that the required size for stiffness was the same so the answer here is W18 by 35 and we can't argue that it was controlled either by stiffness or moment capacity um, at this point because they both came up with the same size beam. Now if we come down here and we look at the floor girders, again, we have 1.2 W imposed dead, 1.6 W live, 1.2 times W uh, as the self weight of the steel joist. And again, that starting number 
is the number that we got from stiffness analysis. So it's right here. So we calculate that load um, is 1.155 kips per foot. We go calculate the moment here, which is this load times the length of the beam squared divided by 8. And we get a required moment of capacity of 130 kip feet. And when we go look at our table and we scan up, we see we need to be in this table. 130 is too much for that beam, but it works for that one. So it's a W12 by 26. So we go here and we write W12 by 26. But when we look back for stiffness, we needed a W16 by 31. So we write that. Um, we'll continue on down the um, single loaded floor girder has uh, a mathematics similar to the single loaded roof girder uh, in that we have to account for the self weight of the girder, which we get an estimate of that from 040, which is um, the sizing from, for stiffness. And then we have this uh, oddball formula, which is this right here, excuse me, that right there, um, which is the length of the beam over two times um, the weight, which is AB37 for the joist, which is gotten from right there. So we calculate that and we get 396.4 is the re required moment strength. And now when we go to this table, um, 396 is up here somewhere. Uh, this doesn't work. That one does. A W21 by 48 is 401. And W21 by 48 gives us a moment capacity of 401 kip feet. Now, clearly, this is one thing we have to account for. Here's another. Um, 21 by 48 and 21 by 48. So they both got the same number. And I'll leave it to you to sort of go through um, these calculations, but um, in this case, the uh, load along the length of the beam, again, is 1.2 times W imposed plus 1.6 times W live plus the self weight of the girder itself times 1.2 plus the load of the joist. So all those things are accounted for in this formula. And we got 790 required. When we go to this table, we see that doesn't work, but we can come right over here and we see 750 is not good enough, but this is. So 840 kip feet for a W24 by 84. And we write W24 by 84 with an 840 kip foot capacity. And again, we have to look back at stiffness and we see we only needed a W24 by 76, but we needed a W24 by 84 for strength. So we write in the larger of those two, which is right here. So that concludes our video. Uh, on sizing steel wide flange beams from tables. As we've mentioned, we've had three parts to this. Part A dealt with using Excel as a load preprocessor and as a method of performing other calculations and organizing and presenting the data. Um, part B dealt with sizing for stiffness and Part C dealt with sizing for moment capacity. And the three of these together constitute the procedure that would be necessary to size steel beams for a grid structure like this from tables.